This is the second part of the soft drink experiment where we look at the analysis for time versus the fixed factors and I'm going to use a general linear model. In this analysis there are problems with the residuals and this might be a little bit tricky. If you're just starting out with general linear models or analysis of variance, you probably want to watch the first part of this series where we look at the height um, of the fizz where there, the residuals are very straightforward and it's a fairly simple analysis. I suggest you watch the two overview presentations I've done to, to, so you can see what's coming up. I'll put some links to those in the description and if you want the data for this project to follow along uh, that's listed under the very first Minitab video for the soft drink experiment where it says getting the data into Minitab and it's just listed in the description there. Okay, so what I've got up here is some the scatter plot of height versus time. We're not actually doing the analysis of height versus time. It's just so you can see the difference between them. Height was fairly straightforward because we had four nice clumps of data that were fairly well um, spread out across the range. Time is very different. We've got this lemonade, when we're looking across the bottom here for time, lemonade and orange are both clumped very tightly together. The Diet Coke is spread out and the Coke is really spread out. So you can see that in the box plot of time, lemonade and orange are fairly tightly packed. Diet Coke is spread out and the Coke is even more spread out. It does look like there's a difference between them. It definitely looks like Coke fizzes longer. Uh, but this difference in the variation is going to cause some problems with the analysis. So let's go up to STAT, ANOVA, uh, General Linear Model. The response in this case is just time. This is the whole model similar to how I input it for the height analysis. So we've got as our model the type of soda, the height of drop, this is the height the bicarbonate of soda was dropped into the soda, uh, the amount of bicarb, and then we've got the interaction terms, type of soda times type of type of drop, uh, height of drop, type of soda times amount of uh, bicarb and height of drop times bicarb. I don't have a covariate in here. I could put uh, uh, height as a covariate if I wanted to see the relationship between height and time. I'm not really interested in that at the moment. I'm just wanting to know if there's a difference in the times of the fizz with the factors that were fixed. We have some options. Uh, so for the results, we definitely want the analysis of variance table. We want the unusual observations. And in the anim animation presentation, there's a I do look at the coefficients for the terms. And this is to explain how the general linear model works, what it's doing. So if you wanted to get these out for yourself, you can get them out here. But we, I don't really need them just at the moment. The storage. Because I know that there's going to be problems with the residuals, we're going to tick that straight away and say store the standardised residuals because then we can look at them more closely. You can store the coefficient values for the model, but it just puts them out into a column without what the coefficients are for. So unless you know the order that it's putting them into the model, this won't mean a lot to you. So you probably want to use the other option here under results to spit out the coefficients if you want them. Under graphs, I do want the four in one residual plot Okay, okay. So, residual plots. If the residuals were normal, which is what we want them to be, then they would follow this green straight line. And they, they don't. There's a wheel in the line. Um, one student told me once that his test was to put a pencil over the line, and if he couldn't see any points underneath the pencil, then they were normal, which sounds fair enough to me. So I encourage you all to get your pencils out. Uh, we can do a proper test on that, of course, because we've saved the residuals. If we look at the histogram, we can see what's wrong with the residuals. Now, they do sort of have a bell-shaped curve, but the problem is these tails are way too fat and the peak is too high. And we can the reason I've saved the residuals is so we can fit that with a normal curve over the top so you can see for yourself what the problem is. If we look at the residuals versus the fitted values, the variance is increasing as the fitted values get larger. And this is mostly because of the Coke, the, all the variation was in the Coke times. And these really tightly packed observations here will be the lemonade and the orange. 
and versus the observation order. Again, this is because the students tested, they didn't randomise the order. They did all the coke first so that the um, carbon dioxide didn't evaporate out of the bottles. May or may not be ideal, but that was the decision they made and so that's why we have this problem in here. And probably I would have done the same thing actually. So I'm not too worried about the versus the order in this case. There are other situations where you might be more interested in the order of the residuals. So that's the problem. Now let's have a look at what else it's done. This is the out analysis output. So we've got these unusual observations which I would expect given the residuals. We have here all the coefficient values so in the overview if you watch that back this is where I'm getting them from. The constant term which is our reference class and you can work out which one that is by seeing which one is missing so it's got a an adjustment for lemonade, Diet Coke and Coke, but there's no adjustment here for orange and that's because orange is our reference class in this case. Same with the height of the drop, we've got an adjustment here for 80 millimetre drop height, so that means that the reference height of 180 millimetres is in this constant term. We have, uh, we are explaining 88% of the variation in the data with our model, which is pretty good. And here we've got the p-values. Now when we did the analysis for height, everything was significant and it was all very easy. Um, thanks for coming, let's go home. So, but now we've got this problem with the height of the drop. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the drop heights. The p-value is the probability of getting the data if the null hypothesis is true. The, that probability is 18%, which is pretty high. So there's a very good chance of getting the data if that hypothesis is true, so there's no reason to suspect the hypothesis is not true, which means there's no reason to suspect there is a difference in the height of the drop. And if that all seems very convoluted, um, you're not alone. It is a little bit convoluted in the reasoning, but that is what it means. And the same here for the interaction term. If you were doing what's called a stepwise regression, uh, you would either start with nothing in the model and pop these terms in one at a time to see if they're significant. If you were doing a backward stepwise regression you would start with everything in the model and then when something wasn't significant you would toss it out, run it again, because every time you change something in the model these p-values will change a bit so you would only add or remove a term one at a time. You wouldn't remove both of these at the same time and then run it again. I would remove the interaction term first and then see if the height of the drop mattered. But I'm not going to, and the reason I'm not going to, uh, you can see a graphical explanation for the types of errors that we get in these models in the presentation. We get type 1 and type 2 errors. But the chances for this particular model, for this general linear model with these residuals, the chances of making a mistake, it's far more likely that this is wrong than the zero p-values are wrong. So there's always a chance that something is wrong um, because we're looking at probabilities, these are not absolutes. But there's different types of errors. errors. You can get a false positive or a false negative. Um, and in this case I know that there's a good chance that this might be a false reading because of the residuals and so I'm not going to throw it out just yet. I'm going to see if I can fix these residuals. So where are the residuals? Let's look at these a bit more closely. Now I've got a lot here. If you've just put this data in clean, then you'll have time, height, type of soda, height of drop, amount of bicarb, uh, BCS, and that should be it. Now I've been doing a whole lot of messing around so I've got a lot of other columns here. The very last column will be where it has stored the residuals. S res 1 standardised residuals. You probably want to change that as soon as you get them or else you're going to forget which residuals they are, especially if you've been running lots of models. So, so you could put something like time residuals full for full model, whatever you like. So you can remember that they're there. Then once you've got them, you can run some more tests. So to start with, let's have a look at the histogram and this time let's have a look at the fit with the normal curve so we can see what it should look, look like. Um, we can look at time as well and time residual full model. Let's look at that. That's not pretty at all. What's it done? 
Okay, I'm going to do these one at a time because I don't like the way it squished them up here. So histogram with fit. Let's just do the residuals first. So here we can see this green line is where we would expect the residuals to roughly fall if they were following a normal distribution. Now when we have values down here we call this having fat tails and up here we call this the peak and this is too peaked. Now when a distribution has fat tails and too peaked it's called kurtotic or it's got high kurtosis. You can also have um, low kurtosis or negative kurtosis where it goes the other way and it's like someone's just put their hand on top of it and squished the whole lot down. And this is what's causing the problem. If we look at the histogram for just time, and this is something you would probably do before you ran the analysis, you would look at this and go, well, that is right skewed because it's been pulled out to the right, which it is. But that's not actually causing a problem in this case. It's this bit here, the kurtosis, which is causing the problem. Now, the assumptions about the general linear model are that the errors are normal. So I'm not too worried about the skewness because that's just in the response. It's these errors in the residuals that's the problem. If I want to have a look at some numerical values for the skewness and kurtosis, we can pull them out with the descriptive statistics. So that's under stat, basic stats, display descriptive statistics. And there's a little button here that you get to, oh, I don't have time residuals. Oh, that must have been an old column. Time residuals full model. And let's look at time for comparison. So I wouldn't pick all of these. You don't want to know all of that. I'm interested in these two here, skewness and kurtosis. OK, OK. So you can see that, let me highlight time. We have a skewness value of 1.33, so that's been pulled out in the positive direction, which is what we can see on the graph. Just bring that up bigger. And we have this kurtosis of 1.87, which is this peaky bit, which is sticking out here. And this is happening because the lemonade and the orange observations were all uh, very close together. For the time residuals, for the full model, what we have is actually a very slight negative kurtosis, and that's pretty close to zero. I'm not worried about that. We can have a look at a formula to see if that's a problem. I'll do that in a second. Uh, what I am worried about is this kurtosis. That's jumped up to 4.48. So that really is what's causing the problems in this case. So you can either blame Coke for being too spread out or you can blame lemonade and orange for being too tightly packed together. But either way, the fact that they have this difference, different variance is causing a problem. So the question might be, how do you uh, how do you know if this is a problem? Now you can have a look at a normality test and if I put in the time residuals there we get this is the same plot from the 4 in 1, the normality test, but this times it actually gives you a p-value out. So if you're big on p-values rather than putting a pencil on top of a line, then you can do this. So the null hypothesis would be that the distribution is normal. Uh, very low p-value means there's a, there's a low chance of getting this data if the hypothesis was true. Therefore, the hypothesis is probably wrong and the data is not normal. Um, we can also look at the skewness and the kurtosis values to see which is the biggest problem. And that's because we might fix them in different ways. So if the data was just right skewed and that was causing the problem in the residuals, then you'd probably try log transform first to see if that fixed it. Um, so if you're not sure which is the bigger problem and you spit these out, there are some rules of thumb that you can use. Now I'd never have a textbook on hand so I can't um, look it up in a textbook but I know everything's on the internet so I'll Google it and turn up a page like this where they've got the skewness and kurtosis, they've res referenced, which is one of the most highly referenced textbooks for this kind of analysis. So I'm guessing they've pulled this straight out of the text, so I'll just go with this. So it says this is the standard error for the skewness. If, if your value for the skewness is more than two times the standard error, 
then you've got a problem. So the formula is 6 on n and then take the square root. So if I had my sample size was 72, so n is your sample size, 6 divided by 72 equals that. Take the square root and that's the standard error according to this formula. And then multiply it by 2. 0.577. So the skewness that we had out here, minus 0.65, it's a tiny bit too much skewed, but it's pretty close. So I'm not very worried about that. If, however, we go down to the kurtosis, we've got another rule of thumb here for the standard error SEK of the kurtosis, 24 on n, take the square root, and two times the standard error. So that would be uh, 24 divided by our sample size of 72. Take the square root uh, times 2, 1.15. And now our kurtosis was much higher than that. Was it 4.48? So that's a problem. And we hopefully we can see that straight from the graph and we don't need to do anything else. I wouldn't actually... if. If I was doing this analysis, I don't even know that I would go that far. If I got this kurtosis value, I would just go look at that graph and say that's a problem. So I'll stop this video here. In the next video, we'll look at some transformations and see if we can fix these problems in the residuals.